All right. So, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to uh, Rev War Revelry. Um, and uh, happy September, everyone. Happy Labor Day weekend. Uh, we are uh, here today uh, with uh, Mr. Tom Hand of Americana Corner. Uh, just give me a brief introduction. He is, of course, the creator and publisher of that blog. Um, what a Friday or so ago, we had a uh, shared some of his recent posts. Uh, yeah. So head on over to the site. Um, he's a West Point graduate, class of 1982, created Gilman Cheese, and then decided to retire to Georgia because he wanted to see heat and humidity. I think so. Um, <laughs> uh, but he uh, is joining us here today to, uh, to talk about the this the revolutionary era. So we're very excited to have you, Tom. And uh, but uh, before we do get started, let's uh, talk about what exactly is and the emphasis behind Americana Corner. Yeah, hey, hey, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I uh, uh, sold the cheese factory uh, and moved south, not for heat and humidity, but to get closer to uh, um, the uh, the scenes of the early uh, part of America, uh, you know, the different uh, battles and things like that. And anyway, um, got down here and uh, uh, started writing for the local newspaper, just a couple articles, and it seemed like it went pretty well. And so uh, I thought, you know, I want to make sure that I can get this more uh, widely distributed. Um, I felt like uh, um, with uh, so much uh, negative messaging out there about our founding era, that I wanted to do my, my small part to, uh, I don't know, to, to remind people of the greatness of our founding and why we should be appreciative of what the founders did. And uh, you know, so it's just a voice in the wilderness uh, uh, helping out and so I started writing and realized that, uh, you know, I, I just loved what I was doing, researching it, writing it. And I, I've always been a bit of a history buff, but uh, um, anyway, and, and so uh, then we got into uh, videos. We, uh, we found that, um, you know, a lot of people prefer to learn through videos as opposed to uh, narratives. And, uh, and so now we do a, a video a week to correspond with the blog post. Uh, kind of chunking, if you will. You, you learn a little bit on Tuesday, you learn a little bit more on, on Friday. And uh, it, it's just been a kick. It really has. And uh, I have a, a great gal. Uh, Sherry Breen has been helping with this. And, and um, Lauren Dennison just joined our team recently. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun with it. Awesome. And so it's, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, blog post almost every other week, you're staying on a very structured <laughs> schedule here. So we do one um, post a week. One post. Uh, one post, one video. One. And uh, any more than that, we'll cut into my uh, golf game and my <laughs> reading. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, well, well, let's get started then. Um, with the blog post recently, there was a few on um, George Washington. So let's, we'll start with uh, Mr. Washington. So mm -hmm. uh, we had a chance, Tom, to uh, meet up a few weeks ago. And uh, yep. I think that he uh, Washington is the, the pinnacle, uh, I mean, the gentleman that uh, you find most fascinating interesting uh from this period well he is you know he's the most uh, fascinating uh impressive man from any period in american history I, you know it, it, what the man did you know people have lost sight of the what he did it, it, everything from uh, the sacrifice of time uh, away from his uh beloved mount vernon and his, his wife uh, martha um to surrendering power uh when he uh, resigned his commission at the end of the American Revolution, which was never done before. And, you know, in, in Europe, guys that became powerful generals became dictators. And, uh, and so we, we have him to thank for that. And then he, uh, you know, he established the presidency and the aura of it um, back when, you know, the, the certain people had to be, a certain character was expected in that position and they were expected to act in a certain way. Now, you know, perhaps you've drifted from that a bit. I won't comment too much on that, but um, but uh, he set that precedent, and then um, and then when he stepped down and peacefully transferred power to John Adams, uh, you know, once again, it's 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 Cincinnati all over again, um, and just such an impressive man. And you picture anybody else in that position, Alexander Hamilton, gifted guy maybe he wouldn't have done the same things President Washington did. Thomas Jefferson, I shudder to think that that guy would have done with that kind of power. Um, 
And so, yeah, he's, um, what do you guys think though? Who's the most impressive guy to you guys? I, I think it's Washington too. Um, our colleague, Mark Malloy, hopefully he's watching. I always give Mark a hard time because he harps on Washington all the time, but okay. you know, um, <laughs> he's right. Uh, and, and you're right too. I think the best thing about Washington is um, he was such a self-aware person. He, you know, he knew the image that he had to put forth uh, his whole life, his whole life. You know, I mean, he, uh, you know, self-taught, you know, the surveying, he, you know, he knew, he, he knew that he had to be a, a, an expert writer to be accepted into the gentry of Virginia. Yep. Uh, he knew how to make connections. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying him and Martha didn't love each other, but he knew how to marry up and he did. Uh, <laughs> hey, I mean, right. I, we, 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 we need to all be so smart. Give him credit but, for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but he was self-aware. He knew that, that he had to behave a certain way for the country, for not just not just the country, but you know the colony when he was you know a Virginian first and then an American mm -hmm. afterwards. That he knew that he had an image that he had to, to put forth, and I think that ties into the stepping down, you know, after uh, the war is over and and doing the two terms and stepping down and, and trying to. Though I do want to debate a little bit later about how he didn't really step down after the second term, but we'll get to that. We'll oh, get to, okay. We'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Uh, <laughs> But I, I just think that he was the right person, right man for that time. It was a perfect match of of the right time and the right person. And um, I think, you know, it still holds up today, at least in my, in my mind. I mean, I, 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 I agree. I mean, he is uh, you remove him from the uh, from the Revolutionary War set or uh, the war collapsed. I mean, he is the, the gentleman. uh uh, had an opportunity uh, earlier in my Park Service career uh, to work as a historian at George Washington Birthplace and get to learn more about the generations that came before him, because uh, he is the fourth generation or third generation born in the colony of Virginia. So there's a long line. Uh, and you always look at like, what's that moment where it turns? Like, why, do, how, why does he do that? Or why doesn't he do this? And, and you just realize that um, he is he, he's wise beyond his ear. I mean, 11 years old, he loses his father. And that's the loss of that connection going to the old world kind of severs that link. The first Washington uh, male, not to go back across the pond, as they right. say. Um, he also, I mean, um, he had a, what I like about him is all the things that he failed, but overcame. So it makes it like a, uh, we like this American story of success at the end, the, mm -hmm. uh, the quote unquote Disney world, like, uh, they get the, they get the prize at the end and i mean he had a heck of a temper but he was able to keep it on their check he worked on that he realized he need i mean for being a big guy being a sports player myself at six five he had great footwork i mean he was a great dancer um and so he knew that was a skill he was a great horseman um great athlete um uh, as one uh fellow ranger said at george washington birthplace the only thing he failed out in his life was returning library books apparently because he <laughs> he checked two out of the new york what state library and they found out they never returned them um so uh the yeah so i mean I, he's not perfect but he's he's as close to that as possible um uh, but yeah i mean he's funny. just one of those and when i was later on writing the book uh went to the one the war I hate to using like turning point or like this is uh, the, the critical moment because we see that a lot in history and it kind of loses its importance. But what I tried to tell him about the book was a series of decisions that Washington made that could have sent the revolution on one spear or another uh, from the Conway cabal uh, that happened. I mean, he could have came out guns blazing, which most of us would have done to defend your name. Instead, he let it play out. And then the decision of how to bring Baron von Steuben in and offset Thomas Conway again, using yep. him as assistant inspector general, or using Nathaniel Green to, to, into the quartermaster department and how that set. So these decisions, um, uh, placing at Valley Forge and not trying to strike Philadelphia uh, for one of those role, like, and of course, that's what you want to do. They just took Philadelphia. You want to get it back. And after Germantown, um, which was a success and a defeat, it's all yeah. these decisions. And that's what's amazing. And uh, I think that's why I, we study history, because um, you can't make that stuff up. There's, there's intersections that happen and you make the right decision or not. Um, you would struggle with some of the, the fiction writing uh, to make that a believable story. So um, and I'll leave with. The last quote is Napoleon on his deathbed supposedly said that he won uh, the French people wanted me to be another Washington. Um, yeah, and so, right. um, 
It uh, wasn't going to happen with Napoleon. <laughs> I mean, he said that on his deathbed in what Saint Helena Island. So that shows you something. Um, yeah, it wasn't. Even, it wasn't even the same hemisphere as France at the time. So, well, you think about the about. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, Tom, you go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you think about the Valley Forge or the uh, the crossing of the Delaware. Excuse me. And um, you know, the, Washington realized that he had to hold the army together. That was the thing. It was the only symbol, the only tangible symbol we had in the eyes of the American people that we could resist Great Britain. And if that army dissolved any further, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna come back. Uh, you know, Congress had no credibility, really, uh, the, the, but the army did. And um, when he made that uh, decision to attack Christmas Day, I mean, that, that's incredible. Um, and, and then he follows it up at Princeton 10 days later. And uh, you know, of course, so many people have said those 10 days shaped our country. And, and it's hard to imagine, given the other generals and a lot of other good men in, in, at that time in America, none of them, in my opinion, could have held the army together, made those assaults, made it all happen. And then, and then of course, after that, you know, things got relatively better. And it's also a, a point um, of what's amazing is a, the tip into his psyche there, because right before they go across at uh, Trenton there, he writes a letter, I think, home to Lund, Washington, about what to do in spring planning or how they're going to do this addition to Mount Vernon. And, I mean, you think about it, like, if they're, they fail, he's probably never going to see Mount Vernon again because yeah. he's going to be. And so to have that, that cool, calm, collected in one of the most stressful positions, yeah. that's, those are the leaders like a later war, uh, Dwight Eisenhower on D-Day or whatever. When you look to the leader and everything's going wrong and he's so calm that he could write a letter back to his overseer about, hey, remember to do this in the spring. Shows <laughs> yeah. you that, I mean, yeah, uh, you, this is a guy you can follow in the battle or lead as an icon, so. Rob? I was going to say, um... I will talk about his military prowess here a little bit. And that's the one thing we always debate internally, me, Phil and Mark and a few other <laughs> friends about, you know, how many battles Washington lost. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that he was able to do at the end of the war, um, he was so you know hell bent on taking New York back. I think it really burned him that he got run out of New York the way he did. Um, and I think he really wanted to, you know, if you, Look at those years. He's in New Jersey in camps. He's always trying to make plans. When the French join the war effort, um, you know, he's trying to get Rochambeau to like, you know, let's just take New York. And of course, right up until the fall of, well, I guess I should say summer of 1781, he is trying to to do that. And then the French engineers, you know, go out and look at these defenses that the British have built, and they're like, this is not, you know, this is not worth the oh. blood that's going to be spilled. So. Oh. He was able to, to take his pride, something he would not have probably have done earlier. He was a very prideful person when he was, you know, um, in charge of Virginia militia during the French yeah. Indian War. Uh, but he put that pride aside and, you know, the, the great opportunity of Yorktown developed because of that. So I think, you know, he evolved throughout the war. Um, I just think the most amazing thing about Washington and, you know, I've read a lot about Washington. I've taken grad school classes with uh Dr. Henriquez, who was on one of our chats uh, last year, great professor of George Washington, is how he is chosen there in Philadelphia. He is, you know, I, I know there's very few men who have any military experience in the colonies at that point, but he doesn't have the most. Charles Lee's have more, the, the Horatio Gates's have more military experience, but they pick him. And, you know, we're going to talk about John Adams a little bit. Of course, John Adams. I was Adams. going to say, John Adams. Adams is such a big player in that. It's just, it, it's amazing to me that they went to Washington. Um, and remember, because, Adam, Adams, a guy from Massachusetts, Hancock wanted the position. Of course, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hancock, yeah. Hancock, I think, um, one of the stories that Phil and I like to talk about in Lexington um, on April 19th is, Sam Adams and John Hancock are there uh, in Lexington. And as the British are coming, the regulars are coming up the road there from Boston, they're trying to they get out the, the, the Hancock Clark house and they're dragging the trunks and stuff. And uh, <laughs> Hancock wants to grab his sword and go to the green. And Sam's like, no, we're men for the cabinet. That's not, that's not where we need to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, Hancock was very much so. But I just think it's just amazing that Washington was picked. And um, that's probably one of the best things that they did, even though, Obviously, the Declaration of Independence comes a little bit later, but that's probably one of the best decisions that the Second Continental Congress made was to appoint George Washington. 
completely agree. Uh, Don't you find it interesting that he showed up, General Washington, that is, showed up to both the first and second Continental Congress in uniform? He had an ego. <laughs> oh, what do you think about that? Well, what's cool about that, too, is, um, you know, that's the Fairfax uh, militia uniform that that he was, you know, yeah. it's it, which ends up being kind of the basis. Right. I mean, there's, yeah. I, I don't want to get into the material culture. because I know a lot of people watching are much more knowledgeable in the material culture of the American Revolution. But, you know, he's he's there in his in his basically his militia uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, that it's yeah that and that's that's a good discussion too is what was in his mind did he you know i don't want the job but i'll take it well you showed up in uniform so you probably want the job right <laughs> well yeah i think and he wanted to first he wanted a regular army commission in the british army and right yes right you imagine if they had given him a commission i mean what america would what, what would, it, would be different it's hard to imagine that but him as a british uh officer or the British Navy, if Living, his mom yeah. hadn't kept him from joining the British Navy, he really wanted to go and, and join. And um, his mom, and there's much debate here in Virginia about how overbearing his mom really was, because um, she was quite overbearing. And uh, proof of that is after George and Martha got married, his mom never visited Mount Vernon. So, oh. uh, <laughs> so I mean, you know, <laughs> for those who are have mother-in-laws that they don't get along with, you know, I think... <laughs> Martha can understand that, but you know his mom kept him from joining the British Navy, which, of course, there's a lot of what ifs in history, but that's that's one of the big ones in early American history is the what if 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 he had joined the British Navy, what could have happened? Went on the seven seas. That's right. Uh, <laughs> no, I think so. And I'm paraphrasing. There's some. Uh, she got some letter back from a relative in England that said, "Well, life in the British Navy is not. Oh, uh, it's horrible. Uh, yeah. um, not worthy of a dog or like a slave's existence." Right. And so that was. Yeah, she was adamant that her firstborn was not going to do uh, that. So, um, yeah, as they say, uh, one of the the best comparisons is that her and uh, George had the same type temperament. So the same ends of the battery and they would always repel each other, very strong willed, very determined. But I mean, you look at her uh, not going off in the weeds too much about Mary Ball, but give her a few minutes, a few seconds here of glory. Uh, sure. I mean, she has a, she has a lot of loss in her life. I mean, by 11 or 12, she's um, parents are gone. Um, then she loses her husband after a few, what, um, she has five children, I think that are still living. Um, the oldest one being George at 11. Um, so you have this whole, I mean, this whole world to kind of navigate through and, um, and not a steady partner to have. And then you have a son like George who wants to go play off in the West. And I mean, here he is just, I mean, to her eyes, vacating the house at an, at an early age instead of doing what, uh, his obligations there to home. But, um, and then, uh, Lawrence Washington, I mean, you can say, uh, try to step into that patriarchal figure for, uh, George himself. And then you have, yeah, that that division between what knows better for my son. But uh, what is interesting in the family Bible, it still says uh, 1730 uh, or it's February 11th, 1731 slash two. So to the day she died, he was always born on February 11th and no one wanted mm-hmm. to, no one wanted to correct Mary Ball. So uh, mother knows <laughs> best. <laughs> so. you know, one thing I've I found interesting in studying uh, uh, General Washington is that uh, people don't talk enough about his, uh, his moral fiber. And, uh, you know, the thing that he and, uh, Adams, in my opinion, have so much in, in, in common is they, uh, they're, they're both principled men, they're both uh, uh, Christians. Now, one was an Anglican and one was a Puritan, but um, uh, they were uh, moral men. They believed that uh, morality and religion uh, helped to shape a, uh, a, a government uh, of the people, that we had to have a certain uh, moral compass, if you will. Um, people don't talk about that, but, uh, you know, that back then was, you know, the, the, the morals of our, co- of our country, the ethics of our country was deemed critical by President Washington. He talks about that in his farewell address as, as the two of the pillars to a, uh, a strong government uh, with our style of government. Uh, and no one really talks about that, but I think we're, you know, you, you could argue that with the uh, decline in, in religion has come a shift in morality uh, in America um, and, you know, perhaps with that has come some of the issues that uh, President Washington alluded to. That's that. Yeah, you're right. He, um, uh, you know, he uh, his religious background has been much debated because 
you know, he he had he had he had a religion, but to say, uh, you know, he wasn't as devout as some of the later Anglicans or you know then Episcopalians later on. Um, obviously, sound the vestry of, of multiple churches, Christ Church, mm-hmm. Pohick Church up the road here for me, um, but wasn't an avid an avid uh, churchman as far as being active. Mm-hmm. Um, I always wondered, um, and you know, I don't I don't know the answer to this, but a lot of of being on the vestry of a church is basically being like a political leader for that, you know, that parish or that County. Okay. And so it's a leadership role as well. Um, not to say he didn't believe in God. I think he did. I'm just saying his, his religious background is something that you see debated a lot and in, in different books, um, essay books specifically that really kind of focus on different parts of his life. And the religious part is very interesting. Um, specifically because of uh, Valley Forge, Phil, when he is there, you know, the very famous, image of him kneeling in the snow and he's, yeah. he's praying, um, which is one of the most recognizable images of Washington other than the Delaware, you know, across the Delaware. But that's that, that image. I think Phil had to put that in your book, right? Cause you, you, you can't leave that yeah. out. No, <laughs> I mean, even though, yeah, it, it did not have, I mean, it did not happen. Uh, I mean, if he did pray, it would have been somewhere quiet in the pot's house uh, or whatnot. But what I will say, and I'll throw this out is that, um, he, at least he didn't create his own Bible, uh, like another founding father. Oh, uh, yeah, no uh, kidding, Phil. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're already <laughs> going to Jefferson now. Holy Phil? cow! I, 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 mean, a, ego. <laughs> I figured I it was a good segue, somewhere. right? It's a good segue <laughs> right there. But no, um, I mean, yeah, it's at it's at um, Mohan. I mean, and it's also too you see reflective in one of the. Re- oh, there oh it look is. at this. <laughs> Madison, you had that handy too. Like you knew right where it was when the whole book so I haven't read it, I'll be honest, but I do have it. Go ahead, Phil. Sorry. No, I, that, I spent a lot of time you know, trying to figure out. I mean, we did uh school programs on the rules of civility and decent behavior and yeah. how long um he carries them throughout his whole life. I mean, yeah. and things of that nature. I mean, there's that running joke that uh what someone says that um between Robert Morris and Alexander Hamilton or something that at the Constitution Convention that that he's on good terms. You could go up and slap him on the back and say, how are you doing, Mr. Washington? And he said, let's be more formal or something than that. Um, met him with a, like a steely gaze. Um, they make a lot about uh, what's the relationship between Martha and, and George. Um, and uh, I mean, Martha, of course, burns most of the correspondence, but um, there is that, fa- I mean, the reason that the, she travels to Valley Forge to Morristown yeah. multiple times, if, yeah. if it's just a marriage mm-hmm. of status, or for the view, she would not have made what almost every winter a journey through very rough right. roads, especially, right. I mean, and think about the prize of capturing George's, uh, the I mean, the Continental Commander's wife, the British, I mean, Tarleton or whoever right. else could have gotten there. So, I mean, it's it's hazardous, but she's there. And, she, and uh, so, I mean, that support and everything that she has. And, uh, I mean, just, you can see it too with uh, her, what, son, um, son, or, yeah, that um, John Park, it just doesn't quite, I mean, Washington, like, tries to give this guy a chance, go yeah. to college, do this. And you can see in Washington all the things he didn't have that he tried to push on to, and just didn't quite understand that, that realm of thinking. And so, yeah, you see that um, throughout the life. Um, one of the things we also told visitors at George Washington birthplace is that one thing that Washington thought and acted in the real world where some of the founding fathers had a tendency, and I know it's, I'm going to be hated in the state of Virginia for keep going after Jefferson, but he had this confliction between the ideal and um, the, the real world. Like, here's where we should be, but here's where we live. Washington and I don't mean saw the world more of this is, this is where it is. And that kind of guided their, their compass. And I think a lot of that had to do with the, uh, the failures early in life. Um, and um, even with Adams being a, uh, always thinking there's a chip on his shoulder kind of we love that american story that i need to prove myself i need to be part of the conversation yeah he wanted he had ambition he had uh you know even as a young man when his dad wanted him to be a a, a preacher uh and he said uh you know no thanks it's what did, i think he said um fame and honor was what he wanted to seek and, and john adams he went after that and uh there's another great man, you know, he, uh, in my opinion, uh, he's the most underrated of our founding fathers. Um, somehow Jefferson gets this big monument in DC. I don't know how that happens. I think he's on Mount Rushmore. I mean, and John Adams, you know, you think about John Adams, uh, John Adams, um, he's, uh, uh, first of all, he, 
he has character like a George Washington. He doesn't have the stature, you know, he doesn't have the aura of a George Washington, but he has the character. Uh, he, he stands up for those uh, British soldiers uh, at the Boston Massacre trial. Uh, only uh, Josiah Quincy would, all, would do it with him. And, uh, um, and then he, uh, he goes to um, the Second Continental Congress and, and uh, really carries the day against John Dickerson, Dickinson. Um, you know, and, and it was important that we get uh, a unanimous vote for our declaration. Now, New York didn't vote. I understand that was 12-0 and one sort of abstention, but, but without Adams's influence, that wouldn't have happened. He gave us George Washington, essentially, by nominating him. Um, and then he goes back home just for a brief time uh, and, and by the way, when he was at the Second Continental Congress, he was on 90 committees. Imagine that, 90 committees, and was the chairman of 25. So he goes back. Well, yeah, no kidding. Well, and, and he wanted to be back home with Abigail, of course, but he's home for just a little while. And then they send him overseas for what ended up being almost a 10-year stint, um, once again, sacrificing for the good of the country. Uh, whereas... Uh, Mr. Jefferson, you know, he barely shows up at the Congress. And then he goes overseas for just a brief period of time, you know, and um, he, and then Adams comes back, he's the vice president, he was just a great vice president. Uh, he has the most votes uh, to break ties ever in the, in the Senate, um, including a vote that uh, prevented the Senate from deciding when a cabinet official could be dismissed. Um, and so Adams was really instrumental in shaping that part of it. He becomes president, you know, and, and he did a fine job there, but he was working against Alexander Hamilton on one hand and Thomas Jefferson, his own vice president, on the other hand. And, and so um, he serves one term, but, but anyway, Adams was another one of those guys that without him, uh, America would look a bit different today, in, in my opinion. And one of the better books I've actually written uh, and I remember the title because it sticks out it's called Magnificent Catastrophe and it talks about that presidential election of 1801 and how the author of the story makes the great point that that is the the test of American democracy because Washington is not going to run for a third term Adams has taken the presidency Jefferson um, is a uh, uh, about to assume the presidency and it could have been really easy for Adams to, to find out a way to hold on to power and really trip up and you see that in a lot of other countries that struggle to turn over it's not that they up, overset a dictator or a ruling party but it's okay now I got to give it up to a political adversary and yeah he sticks him with John Marshall for the next 20 years on the Supreme Court um, <laughs> but uh, and I mean and then Jefferson I mean yeah his presidency I mean has to uh, kind of come out of the shell a little bit with the Barbary Coast and realizing you need yeah. a little bigger bureaucracy um but no i mean is that is that test and um and one of the, the better people i mean behind him and i think is one of the greatest uh first ladies is actually abigail adams i mean she is mm -hmm. a highly intelligent woman um who actually i mean is can you can bounce ideas off of her and and uh she comes from i mean from a well-connected uh family as well i think they're all from that brain tree area um and somehow they're loosely related to the, the warrens who bring mercy otis warren one of the yeah. first great historians but yeah i mean that's the the adam and then um he kind of sets up i mean his son john quincy is yeah. probably one of the smarter presidents um and ironically the only president with a foreign-born wife if anyone's playing trivia at home um, oh, from germany just, right uh i think so yeah uh either Berlin? Yeah, I think she was born. Yeah, in Germany, she spent her uh, young life in London, so she was well well versed. But um, Louisa, Louisa, that's it. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, you see him as a young guy learning. I mean, I mean, as a young kid overseas as well. I mean, and that's one of the things Adams does yeoman service, especially getting yeah. loans out of the Dutch, um, yeah. the Low Countries there, and so forth. So, um, but yeah, I know uh, we had uh, one comment pop up. It goes, "Can we stop uh, bashing Jefferson?" So I had to throw. <laughs> I had to throw a Jefferson thing in there. I mean, his home is impressive. He's got a great university that used to play good basketball a few years ago, I think. Right? All right, Phil. All right. Don't, all right. Here we go. <laughs> but no, we it, go, is, it is. It uh, is. No, it is. It, it's a great, I mean, great campus with a great uh, history department. So, but I no, think I mean, uh, somebody else too in the chat here, I'm going to watch this chat. Um, Craig's talking about the Dickinson and Adams rift, which I think, um, you know, I think you know, the John Adams HBO miniseries, uh, you know, for yeah. all the 
you know, historians love to pick apart Hollywood, right? But I thought that was pretty, that did a pretty good job showing uh, not just the Dickinson Adams, two different types of, you know, their religions played a big part in that rift, right? Uh, how, you know, they they live lives, they, how they interacted socially with other people. Adams, very direct, very kind of in your face. Dickinson, more of the, you know, kind of, you know, Quaker sensibility, as they say in the movie. Um, and the movie also shows back to Jefferson really quick. I'm not going to bash Jefferson, but um, it, it kind of shows how Jefferson's thought of the revolution was ongoing. Adams yeah. saw the revolution as we won it, we have our republic, let's go for it together. Yeah. Jefferson saw revolution as an ongoing thing. Jefferson, you know, saw that like the country would keep evolving and revolution now and again, that's pretty good. I mean, you know, it's fine. And Adam's like, well, that's chaos. We can't, can't have chaos. Um, you saw that in France and Jefferson, you know, was, you know, was really much in the French, in, in the French politics. And I think, you know, uh, Adams was really worried about that because he didn't want, he wanted stability here in this country. And uh, thankfully, you know, obviously we have ups and downs. We had big civil war ourselves, but, you know, from the very beginning of that, you know, that time period, the federal period, the early Republic, you know, um, the Adams school of thought won out, you know, Jefferson did do two terms and there's a whole slew of presidents because of Jefferson, but they never really engaged or, you know, adapted that ongoing revolution thought um, of, of, you know, chaos. So, um, I'm not convinced that, you know, I, I, I've heard him say that, you know, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, he said that when he was uh, out of power, mm -hmm. uh, when he got into power, um, he got like so many other people who get into power that they don't want change because right. they got it. And, uh, and so you know, uh, Adams, he was disappointed uh, in John, uh, in James uh, Madison, excuse me, um, <laughs> that James Madison didn't do more that Thomas Jefferson wanted him to do. Um, and so I'm not, you know, you could argue that Madison started shifting away from Jefferson a bit. Um, and uh, Jefferson wasn't happy about that. So I'm not convinced Jefferson really wanted uh, a revolution if it meant his ideas weren't going to be followed. Right. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, we were talking about uh, Jefferson working against Adams. You yeah. know, one thing, the more you read about Adams terms president, Washington is actually working a little bit against Adams, too. Um, you know, hey, and, be careful there. Uh, hey, I'm just saying he is. I'm just saying he is. Look, man, I, lo I love George. You saw the por you saw my Washington portrait in my office yeah. that day we chatted. That's uh, right. That's right. <laughs> but you know, I think I, and Washington, in his older age, knew that the right thing to do was a step away, but had a hard time doing it, which is understandable, right? This is his. He kind of saw this as his, you know, responsibility. Yep. And he never really, I mean, he never really gave Adams the support that I think Adams thought he should have gotten, um, you know. Oh, when, when, he was, when Adams was president or when Adams yes, was president? Yes, yes. Well, I would say a little bit of both, right? I mean, you know, Washington would go to Hamilton a lot more frequently. He would go to Adams for, for advice. That's yeah. just that's just what he did. Yeah. And I think that rankled Adams a little bit. Obviously, it's probably a little bit of jealousy there, which is yeah. understandable, right? Yeah. Nobody ever, nobody ever wants to follow the coach that won the Super Bowl. I mean, you're always going to be, <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to be overshadowed. Right. Um, but I think you know, we look at uh, the quasi war with France. You know, Adams uh, goes to Washington, and you know, Washington de designs his own uniform and says, "I'm not, I'm not going to take the field, but you're going to put Hamilton in charge of the army." And Adams is like, "Well, I can't do that." And Washington's like, well, if you don't, I'm not going to be part of it. Yeah. And I mean, like, can you, I mean, <laughs> poor yeah, Adams. Well, you know, you're right. You're right. Poor Adams. What do you, I mean, what's he do? I mean, it's like, I can't, I can't take, you know, I can't take on the, the hero of this country. Yeah. Um, and obviously the war never broke out, which is, which, you know, which is good. Uh, but, you know, he, Hamilton, uh, Adams and Hamilton were just, you know, <laughs> just did not like each other. And I think there's some of that's jealousy and some of that Hamilton's very, I mean, Adams is ambitious too, but I think Hamilton had a level of ambition that very few people in that cat in Washington's cabinet um, had. So. And here's the other thing I'll, I'll throw out there. If it, um, just about uh, the different presidency. I mean, following using that theme of following the Super Bowl coach, 
Um, I mean, anyone uh, that studies this era could probably name the whole cabinet under George Washington. I would bet someone 10 bucks if they can name off the top of their head the whole cabinet under John Adams. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, you yeah. think about it. Uh, and I mean, that's one of the ones that everyone gets is, of course, uh, what John McHenry or, uh, is the Secretary of War, basically because he puts his name on that fort in Baltimore. Fort. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Most I mean, the Treasury, right? Uh, Ellsworth Pickering was in it as well. I think Pickering, Pickering yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you got to think about it for a few minutes, yeah. even yeah. the ones like us who study this tremendously. But I mean, Washington, everyone's like, oh, it's, you got Henry Knox, you've got Alexander Hamilton, uh, it's, Randolph. Uh, it's a who's who. Of, yeah, it's a who's who. I mean, it's so, a who's who. Yeah, it's an amazing and, cabinet. And I think, too, you you also see that, um, I mean, from the Mad into the Madison, into the Monroe administrations, is the formation of the, the next generation of these political elites. I mean, you've got the people passing from the stage that led the revolutionary movement and so forth. Uh, I know someone uh, was trying to do a study on how many of the signers actually lived into the into the 1800s and how many just passed from the scene in the 1780s and 1790s. Uh, so, I mean, that's it, what, we, what we forget is this is all new as uh, another display at the birth, Washington birthplace used to say is that there was three examples for America to pull the U.S. Constitution off of. They said ancient Rome, ancient Greece, both had democracies. And then France had a democracy for about 20 minutes in between uh, <laughs> the different things. So you said that's what they're going off of at that time. So, I mean, yeah, so it's remarkable. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that with the Constitution, putting 50, what, some men in one room to uh, hammer out something. Everyone knows when you don't want something, the Declaration of Independence. But now, uh, I think it was Jefferson who called him what a, uh, a committee of demigods or whatever. And I, I, whether that's derision or not, it was. I mean, to get any type of agreement out of that room, maybe just because it was hot and humid, but it's a lot <laughs> harder to knock out an agreement on what you do want from a declaration of what we don't want. So I think there's a lot to test to uh, what this will look like. And the Adams, I mean, is dealing with the XYZ affair, the a cabinet that he, he probably knows McHenry is leaking letters to Washington and then having, uh, I mean, the highlights of his own. Hamilton, party. you mean, not Washington. I think I uh, wasn't Washington writing to uh, McHenry, uh, the Secretary of War during the uh, Adams administration. I think that's what he was getting. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. know that. I think so. I mean, he was getting some of the, because Hamilton was out of the administration, if I if I'm correct, uh, he was. I might be mistaken. Yeah. So McHenry, there were, there are letters in Washington's, uh, uh, that are actually online too. part of the, uh, what the, the transcripts that he's writing that. to the secretary, secretary of war, um, on, and, uh, McHenry feels obligated to, uh, write back to Washington. You don't just, okay. you just don't ignore, uh, George Washington if he sends <laughs> you a letter. So, yeah, right. But, uh, so, yeah, no, I think that's a major part is, yeah, the uh, the formation of a, a cabinet. But I still think, I mean, the big test for democracy is 1801. Then uh, he walks out the door, Jefferson walks in. And then, I mean, once again, and, and James Monroe is one of my favorite of the founding fathers, uh, just because yeah. he's wearing uh, buckled shoes and knee breeches still in the 1820s. The guy's, <laughs> right. the guy's not changing. He's got a bullet in his shoulder from Trenton, um, and he's still um, – but yeah, I mean, he walks out the door. It's the era of good feelings. And he's what one vote away from being unanimously elected like George Washington. But yeah. you see him go through the divide from being a Jefferson protege to being Madison's go to guy to standing on his own with the Monroe Doctrine. So um, I just had to plug James Monroe. Well, we're gonna, um, yeah, we're, so we got we're going to do uh, I bring on my friend Scott Harris in two weeks, the director of the James Monroe Museum and talk about James Monroe. Um, but to tie in with Washington. They had a huge falling out. Um, you know, I mean, they're writing things, you know, Washington, you know, finds out things that Monroe is saying about them. And it's it's ugly. You know, it's it's very ugly. Washington's second term is, you know, not as politically. Uh, I'm trying to think the word here. Peaceful as the first term was um, a lot's got to do with Jefferson. Not going to lie. You're right about that. Uh, Jefferson, you know, has now totally gone rogue and and you know is is writing things about everyone in papers under studio names and everything else so yeah. uh, jefferson's probably one of the first modern politicians that you think of today right like win at all costs tear down the character of your opponent um you yeah. know if, if there was social media and tv during jefferson's time he would he would be paying for all the commercials i'm watching every morning on our, <laughs> our election here for governor of virginia it's like every every 10 you know minutes there's a new commercial jefferson 
Jefferson did that. He was, yeah. I, I think, I think Washington was political as well, but I think Washington was a little more subdued about it. He, as I said at the beginning, he, he, he knew he had an image and that would not have been a good image for him to have. So he had Hamilton to do that. Right. So Hamilton could do that work for him. Um, Yeah. But Monroe and and Washington, uh, sadly, you know, uh, had a great relationship up to that point and um, never really, you know, obviously Washington died soon after that, but it never got repaired. Madison also turned on him, Mm -hmm. uh, fellow Virginians and, um, and uh, he uh, he really drank the Kool Aid of the other side, Madison. That is. Uh, and um, anyway, yeah, it's it's a shame that the uh, uh, they felt kind of fell apart after we no longer had a common enemy. But um, isn't sure. that often the case in history? You know, sure uh, is. You take a look at look at India uh, breaking free from the British Empire. They're all together until there wasn't the British to hate. Then they split. I mean, it's just right. the way it works. And I think, too, Washington and um, we have this debate again when we meet and have drinks and, and debate history. But um, Washington was an American after the revolution. He saw himself as an American first, yeah. where I think Jefferson and Madison, um, at least originally, but maybe before they became president, mm-hmm. saw themselves as Virginians first. Okay. You know, the. You know, looking about the Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky resolves that basically says, you know, the state, any state can, yeah. you know, nullify any federal law. Washington never would have gone along with something like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think Jefferson saw themselves as, and and Monroe to a point, and Madison saw themselves as Virginians. And you know, this great experiment of this republic is great, and we'll stay in it, and we'll keep doing it as long as the interests of the states are are upheld but you know i think washington was all in all in 100 percent, all in what do, you think about, you know? what do you think about john adams all in or not yeah i think he's all in too mm-hmm. i do too you know i remember reading a, a great quote from john adams let's see if i can get this right uh sink or swim live or die survive or perish i am with my country mm. and you know what a great statement. And he was saying that as he was uh, uh, leaving for the uh, Continental Congress to one of his British friends. But, um, you know, that, that's the big difference that I see between uh, like Washington and Adams and some of the other guys who were very instrumental in it. Uh, you're right. They, America came first. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't Virginia first. It was, a, it was America first. And that's, right. you know, it's a whole Robert E. Lee thing, isn't it? Right. I mean, you know. It's a difference there. Yep. Yeah. Why one why one way and not the other? I don't know. Yeah. And, and you know, it took a while for John Adams to get to the point of a revolutionary. Um, yeah. You know, uh, the, some of the things the the Sons of Liberty were doing in, in Boston, you know, Sam Adams, his cousin and others. He was turned off by a lot of that. Um, yeah. He was uh, he was a, a you know, an attorney and, of course, a farmer as well. But, you know, yeah. he believed in the rule of law. And a lot of things that they were doing was against the rule of law. And he even had some some misgivings about going to the Continental Congress because he didn't know what authority this group would even have. Yeah. You know, like what what legal authority is this group going to have? And really the legal authority they had was it was the leaders of all the colonies. So they just kind of made up their own legal authority. But um, they obviously had the support of the majority of the country at a certain point. But, you know, Adams it took a while for Adams to get there. You know, I think that, you know, some yeah. of the actions that took place there in Boston, um, obviously, you know, the tea party, but obviously then, you know, blood, blood being spilled. Um, and let's be honest, a really good propaganda game. Uh, I mean, propaganda plan by, by the, by the sons of Liberty. I mean, you know, Phil and I studying lessons and Concord for our book, uh, you come across this a lot where the Americans won, Right here. PR, they want. Thank you. There that, it is. Yeah, <laughs> and we're not American, paying them to do that either. We, that we, was yeah. great. <laughs> the Americans won the PR battle. They won the PR battle on April 19, 1775. You know, uh, Hancock had paid for a ship to take the news of what happened on April nineteenth to England before Gage, before Gage even gets anything out. 
Uh, so when the, when the people in, in across the ocean are reading about what happens on April 19th, they're reading the American version, or I should say the Patriot version of the events. Um, and so I think that that plays into, you know, swaying his public opinion and, and back to John Adams, he just, he, he wasn't there at that point, but he was getting there. And obviously by April 19th, he was, he was there. And you know, to, oh. I'm sorry, go ahead, Bill. No, I was just going to uh, add build on that point. Uh, there is, um, a, a, new, a book that came out last year and a half or so called American Rebels, and it talks about the, the, the brain tree, the area of that, uh, and it talks uh, about how the Adams, the Quincy, the Otises, the Warrens, this, they all kind of originate from this area, and it's like a think tank for ideas and so forth, and Adams credits so it is James Otis Jr. for what he said in 10 minutes propelled the, I think, revolution 10 years forward about his, his thinking and so forth, paraphrasing that quote, but fortunately Otis has an altercation, I think, in a coffee house, gets hit over the head, starts losing his uh, wits and yeah. intelligence, and ends up fading from the scene. But, um, I mean, he's related to Mercy Otis, uh, who writes one of the first great histories. But uh, Adams, you can see a lot of that resonating in his writing. And that's, I think, the biggest, um, and I use the John Adams when I talk community college, that miniseries, um, about why did he uh, represent the um, the British soldiers and because uh, that's what was right. That's the rule of the yeah. land. And that yeah. shows John Adams psyche is that, yeah, uh, emotional, emotional, you want to stick with your, your countrymen or your fellow colonists, yeah. but no, it's, this is what's needed. And if in the eyes of the world, this is things that will happen that as we move toward it, you can see Adam's logical mind, maybe as a lawyer presenting these facts, this Rolodex in his head, yeah. these are the steps we need to take for legitimacy to get there. But I think a lot had to do with, yeah, that upbringing and everything, bringing in that, that culture of having all these ideas and, and bounce around. I mean, it, um, and just some of the intellect that, that was there. Um, You're the, right about that. Uh, he, you know, right is right. Wrong is wrong in John Adams' mind. Mm -hmm. And um, and he was a man of firm character. He didn't, uh, and he would do things that made him unpopular, like uh, defending the, the British soldiers. Um, <clears throat> you know, he... Uh, famously did not take us to war against France. Uh, I won't go talk too much more about the, his presidency, but uh, France was insulting us. They were raiding our ships. They were doing all kinds of things. He had support to go to war. Uh, it was very unpopular to not go to war, uh, but he did what he thought was right uh, and kept us out of that war and cost him the election, in my opinion. Um, and, and so he was a very principled man. And, and you contrast him with uh, you know, maybe the father of the American Revolution, uh, Samuel Adams, and at least that's what he was called back in the day. Um, you know, here's a guy who uh, sort of supported tarring and feathering customs officials doing their duty, doing their work. I mean, these guys were hired to collect taxes. Now, no one likes tax collectors. I don't like the IRS either, but <laughs> this tarring and feathering thing, you know, and, and uh, to justify, because you think the, the end is, is right, I, I, I struggle with that a little bit. And uh, I just wrote an article on the Boston Tea Party, uh, one on the Boston Massacre, you know, and uh, these guys, uh, the Boston Massacre, they weren't like Boy Scouts out there. No. You know, little placards holding up saying, oh, please go home, British soldiers. These guys were pelting these soldiers, once again, doing their duty, standing guard with, with ice and wood and, and snowballs and stuff. Who's not going to shoot back? You got to defend yourself at some point. And so we, we make it out like it's a massacre, like the Brits did the wrong thing. Well, what about the provocation? Mm -hmm. And John Adams didn't buy into that stuff. He said, no, wrong is wrong. And uh, can you imagine standing up to the whole town of Boston, a, a wealthy attorney who has a legal practice that could go to shambles, and he, he stands up and says, no, it's the right thing to do, and I'm doing it. And, Wow, what a man of character! And 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 that when the when um, after the tea party, when one of the punishments um, for that, you know, the Parliament says that if anyone and it, you know, any British official who's charged with a crime will be tried back, you know, back, back yeah. in back in England. Yep. You know, Adams argued, <clears throat> you know, we. They, they could get fair trials here. You know, he yeah. pointed to the massacre, yeah. uh, you know, those guys there. So that really, you know, that, that one, that's one of the ones that really irked him the most, I think, is the fact that, you know, uh, there's that whole idea of, of jury of your peers, you know, being, um, 
being judged by people that you that where you are. Um, but you know, I think, I, but you're right though, as far as Boston Massacre goes, I mean, you got, and we also forget too, um, you know, those British soldiers are, they're kids, right? Kids. I mean, they're kids, right? Yeah. I mean, you take any 20 something year old kid, you throw stuff at him, he's going to fight back at some point. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah, it, it was just, it was an ugly scene and you know, the mob was our side. And so when the mob is our side, it's not a mob, right? It's demonstrators. Right. <laughs> right. You are right. Yeah, it's, all, it's all in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. And that hasn't changed at all today either. No kidding, Rob. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not changed. I mean, we it's still do that changed. today. Um, <laughs> as, as we wind down, Tom, I was going to ask you, um, you know, one question that I wrote down here while we were chit-chatting here. Um, what do you think, um, you know, if you, when you stay Washington's uh, term as president and John Adams' term as vice president, you see, you know, Adams is, is very much kind of get this notion that he is really serving a, a pointless role. He's got a very famous yeah. quote about it's the most useless, important job in the yeah, history, that's of, right. history that's right. of mankind. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think Washington didn't lean on him? Uh, they had a relationship, obviously, from before the war, well, at the beginning of the war. Uh, and, you know, they knew each other well. Uh, you know, in your thought, I know, I know I'm putting you in the spot here, but what, because we always debate that here, too, is like, you know, why didn't Washington rely on him? Well, was it was it the sense that he didn't know everybody was just trying to learn their roles in this new government? Or do you think he just just didn't get along with them at that point? You know, I don't think that was the case. You know, President uh, Washington um, was a kind of guy who didn't even fire uh, Horatio Gates. Right. I mean, he didn't fire me. And, and these other people that worked against him, he didn't fire many people. He didn't, he didn't dismiss people for personal reasons. And so, no, I don't think it was a, a personality thing. In my opinion, and I don't have any factual basis for this, I think President Washington just didn't think that that was the role of the vice president. Um, I think he felt like uh, he was supposed to have these advisors and they were the advisors and, and uh, John Adams was supposed to step in if anything happened to President Washington. But um, I don't think it was anything personal. It's not like it's because he didn't serve and Washington and Hamilton did serve. Jefferson didn't serve and he had respect for Jefferson. And I don't think Randolph served, I, I mean, in uniform. Um, because I've, sometimes I've thought, well, was it because he, he wasn't a soldier? You know, he had great respect for Marshall and he had great respect for Monroe until they had their falling out. But uh, so I, in, in my opinion, if Washington felt like it was the right thing to do, he would have done it because it was, would, have, would have been his duty. And Washington was the ultimate duty-bound man. So I think in some ways he felt like it wasn't supposed to be that relationship. Right. What do you think about that? No, I think I, I think you're right, and I think that's the one thing that started to to really start that rift between those two men, and and then of course you know Washington's you know we said this earlier Washington sought the counsel of Hamilton quite frequently as time went on, yeah. and Adams saw that as a threat. You know, I'm the vice president. He saw himself as you know the the next in line. If something should happen, he should be the closest advisor to the president, and then Hamilton comes in and kind of really works against Adams um, yeah, and, right. and, and creates that rift. And I think it, it sets the tone, right, for other vice presidents. Obviously, Jefferson being Adams' vice president was a disaster. <laughs> he just, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> he went to Monticello. Well, I mean, back then, you know, I mean, can you imagine today if the second person, yeah. in, it, the second highest vote getter became president, how much yeah. more interesting politics would be today? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah right, right. <laughs> I mean, but Jefferson just takes off. It goes back to Charlottesville. He's like, I'm done with this. I, I, I can't. There's nothing I can do here. And that really, that, that, upsets, that upsets Adams. It hurts him. You know, yeah. Adams is continually hurt by Jefferson. And he's hurt by Washington too, not as much, but uh, he took it very personally. And you know, the letters they write back and forth to each other when they make amends and become great pen pals, which is an amazing, you know, that's a whole nother Sunday night chat, Phil. We should probably do is just those letters back and forth. How these two men in their older age go, yeah, we were probably we were probably jerks back then to each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And I will agree with you, Tom, Jefferson's more of a jerk than Adams. But, <laughs> but you know, it's just, it's interesting how that sets the tone for the vice presidency, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, most, well, I don't know about today, but I could, I used to be able to do all the presidents, I can name them all, but the vice presidents, you know, it's, yeah. it's hit or miss. Yeah. You know, the, um, you also, you're talking about the Washington Adams thing. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, I've never been uh, in, in combat. I went to West Point, but I just served in the peacetime army. But you wonder how much of that leaning on, uh, on Hamilton was that band of brothers thing. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, there must be something to the friendships you forge when your lives are in danger mm -hmm. that we can't even imagine. And, and I wonder if that's why it was always Washington and Hamilton. He was, it was his guy. He was, you know, they were facing the fire at the same time. And I just wonder if there's something to that. I think it, uh, I mean, weighing in here a little bit, uh, I think it's even more on a deeper level. Uh, Hamilton is Washington 2.0. He doesn't have a father figure. He is uh, drifting okay. the world. He, he has to make it his own. I um, mean, because he's what rescued, I think, uh, Nevis uh, by someone who sees his intellect. Yeah. Um, so yeah. he makes him up because you look at, I mean, you have Henry Knox, who's, in the boat with them at uh, Trenton and Princeton and yeah. does the uh, whole thing. But Knox mm -hmm. kind of gets ostracized as well and kind of put over here and so forth. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's a lot of Hamilton is a little more abrasive, a little more upfront where Washington is more reserved, but uh, I mean, if he would have lived as well, John Lawrence um, who gets killed at the, what, uh, some small river battle in 1782 or uh, 82, 83 in South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, late yeah. in the war, he might have been another one. These are guys, um, but Hamilton, I think, had a lot of the, the Washington personalities without the facade that Washington built up. Without the, the character, the you think in Washington's character, what's that? You think uh, Hamilton had Washington's character? I think yeah. he had that drive, he had that passion, he had that, that, um, uh, but he, he, I think he was, uh, this is not an awkward Washington, I think Hamilton had a uh, keener intellect. I mean, his Federalist okay. Papers, the way he was able to, to navigate now, sometimes I think that led him astray. Um, he, uh, he did not have that uh, high as a moral compass as Washington did. Yeah. Um, but I think he always had that chip on his shoulder that I've got to prove something because I'm coming from nothing and I'm not going back there. And Washington had that chip with the, the British. I've got to prove that why I didn't get the commission or why I wasn't uh, uh, fighting to get into the top society of uh, the pre-war colonial. Yeah. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, and Washington, I mean, you look at a lot of Washington staff officers, they are the ones he resonates most with. Tense Tillman and other ones are young, motivated uh, men yeah. that he sees a lot like himself. And I think yeah. he is a, the father of the country in, in so many ways. And that's another one is separating some of these men uh, in, as a fatherly figure. And I think, yeah, so it is a part of the Band of Brothers because they were there during the thick of the fighting. But I think it's also on that personal level that Washington saw a rough ideology set of Hamilton or a lot of him in Hamilton and yeah. tried, and, and felt um, comfortable uh, going to that. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, well, Phil, did you just say, uh, did you say Hamilton was Washington 2.0? Is that what you just said? Because that is not <laughs> I, in the- I heard that. Is, that. That is not the official opinion of emerging revolutionary war, folks. I'm telling you right now, that is not the official <laughs> opinion. So. I'm not. So I'm I just think... just boiled down to the page. let me let me let me take a minute to defend this before we just uh, get on some type of um, yeah. So that way I can still come back to the state of Virginia and see you, Rob. Um, I was going to say because I'll be we're going to meet you at the river, man. It's Potomac. We're waiting for you. <laughs> so actually, Potomac is Maryland, so you can meet me on the oh, other side. Uh, now, um, but no, you think about it. I mean, they both they both don't have a father figure from a very young age in life. They both uh, have to rely on their own way to navigate the world um and washington i mean washington, well, washington is from a rich family he's not the richest he's, family but come he's, on he's middle class yeah i mean but uh, middle class i wish that was that middle class <laughs> <laughs> they had land all over they had, they had like four farms <laughs> he washington himself didn't have four farms when poor when tom has to watch phil and i argue here so i'm gonna, no, I'm gonna this, be quiet. Is, this is fun entertaining when, when washington's <laughs> father dies george has what ferry farm when he becomes of age so he doesn't have land um, his half brother, he's lucky that his half brother's daughter didn't survive, that um, the Washington men had a tendency to die young before George. Um, but I mean, you think about just that having to rely on yourself, Washington self-taught, Washington learned survey and Washington learned who you have to curry the favor to. Hamilton does the same thing, learns how to curry favor to that gentleman, that merchant who gets him to New York, to King's College, uh, learns, I mean, to curry up to Washington. 
hitch your horse to Washington and he'll take you to the top. So, I mean, you see Washington does that with the Fairfaxes before the war as well. Uh, learn where, where you make your money and your prestige. So, I mean, yeah, there, Washington is very ambitious. Um, and why, but Washington also realized has a higher moral compass where Hamilton doesn't care if he offends people or if he, I mean, that's the difference is and, well, yeah, the basic I, facts are the same, but then you can't take on the moral side is what makes them different. Washington's I, moral compass is higher. I think, I think you said it. I think Tom said too, there's the band of brothers aspect, which is very important, but I think Washington saw himself as a father figure to Hamilton. And I think that's, that was, you know, Hamilton, Washington Adams, didn't have that patriarchal relationship where Washington does have that with Hamilton. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's just uh, the difference in relationships and, you know, and maybe Washington leaned on Hamilton a little bit too much, but, you know, we all, we all go to where we're, where we have trusted advisors and, you know, it doesn't yeah. always, our, our, not all of our friends agree with us on things, <laughs> but I think that, uh, I think it was a patriarchal relationship between the two as well. And, and I think the band of brothers part, Tom is, is a really good point. Um, you know, Hamilton there at Yorktown is, you know, question, you know, question the readout. So he's, yeah, right. you know, he's, right. he's ordered in there. And I think Washington has a lot of respect for him on that. So, but sorry about that. I mean, for Phil and I take over the, uh, no, that's great. We'll debate. We'll debate the Potomac River next time, Phil. That's because of George Mason, by the way. But that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Virginia giving it over to a Marylander, so that uh, we're just being nice about it. <laughs> yeah. We appreciate it. Yeah. One thing too, someone mentioned in the chat here. Is we, I know we're getting a little past our time. Uh, Craig here mentioned about you know Washington probably never would have gotten into a duel like Hamilton did. You know that didn't uh, really point. didn't really. Didn't really, yeah, didn't really fit Washington's uh, character or his personality. Not to say you have bad character back then if you do a duel, because it was obviously a widely accepted practice, but something Washington, um, you know, never got involved in. So, anyways. Well, you, you just have to ask this. Uh, Phil, I'm going to ask you now. You've, you've uh, said Hamilton's Washington 2.0, and uh, I will strongly disagree. But if you, if, if Hamilton, had been the commander of a continental army, do you think he would have uh, given up control to Congress or do you think he would have become dictator? I mean, so the, the, the one caveat I'll put is would have Washington uh, at the same age, would Washington as a 20 some year old in the French and Indian War given up command of something at that time in his life that, ha uh, that Hamilton as commander in chief? If Hamilton lives to be 40, 50, does he learn does those passions dull? Um, that's that's the big equation. How, what, I mean, Hamilton's a meteor shining brightly. Uh, I don't think if he would he wouldn't have survived if he didn't survive a duel. I don't think he was living to old age. Um, he just he just wasn't that type of guy. Um, that's so. There are. I but I, I'll play I'll play the I'll play the card. I think he would have. I think I mean Hamilton's. Uh, we don't see the end of Hamilton's arc because of that duel. Um, I think we see uh, the difference is Washington understand Washington's a better strategic thinker. You understand? I mean, you look at that Valley Forge winner um, and afterwards, how many people step in to fight duels for Washington? Ted Walter and uh, Lawrence and all these guys are willing to fight for him. Uh, yeah. So Washington uh, builds it up. And I mean, he learns that. But I think the Washington that's at Fort Necessity or the Washington that's um, that is angered by the non getting the British commission, um, he might have been hot headed enough, but he learned to control it. And that's where uh, Hamilton never does. And maybe uh age would have done it maybe it's just washington or so yeah it's a, but i know i'm kind of doing the political answer of dancing around uh here a little bit <laughs> no but you I said mean, no you answered you said he oh would, i said no okay said, good you said he would have he would think, you, you think he would have stepped down i mean i think he was too principled in the ideas of once again going back to that band it's that suffering thrill um okay. and everything and i mean his and i'll throw one more caveat at 2.0 to try to argue my case he marries into the schuyler family very rich people, uh, much like Washington marries into the Custis. So a lot of men did that, Phil. <laughs> but smart so, man. I mean, smart Jefferson, man. Jefferson did that too. So I mean, behind every good know. man, there's a better woman, is what they That's say, right? right? That so is they, actually uh, that is something I think we all can agree on. True. Yep. <laughs> but now uh, I will argue that case. I, I will go down with the ship here about uh, Hamilton and, uh, <laughs> okay. and uh, Washington. Enough. But. Fair enough. 
I don't want to, so I'll stick, I'll stick to it, even though it's a losing call. So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, um, with that, I think, I mean, uh, we could probably go on all night. Uh, we'll that went by quick. Have, yeah, we'll probably have to have Tom back again to, to argue more, so I can uh, maybe a Hamilton, <laughs> maybe a Hamilton Washington debate or something uh, okay. <laughs> in, in the in the future. But now, um, but we do invite you uh, to talk about another one of those young uh, band of brothers in uh, two weeks. Uh, obviously, we're back uh, here uh, on Rev War Revelry with a talk on James Monroe. It's actually the build up to uh, November, uh, November twelfth to the fourteenth, the ten crucial days: uh, Trenton, Princeton, Assunpink Creek. Um, you can debate with us in person, uh, either on and the we bus. Do this, and we do this in person quite and a bit. we actually. do this in person, <laughs> yes. Um, and, uh, but we hope to see you there. Otherwise, uh, continue to check out the uh, blog, um, emergingrevolutionarywar.org. Of course, Americana Corner. Um, and we, at, at the end of every month, we share a snapshot on what's going on. But please uh, head over to check those videos out. Um, and um, any final thoughts, uh, Rob? I don't want to uh, sign off. Too quick. I'll, uh, I want to hear Tom's final thoughts. thoughts. Final thoughts. There this you go. has been great. Uh, Phil, Rob, you know, I can't thank you enough. You know, this is a, it, it's just a blast uh, kicking around ideas with other passionate, uh, well read uh, American historians. It's just, uh, it, it's a nerdy thing to do, but I just love doing it. And uh, thank you so much. This has just been wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. It's been fun. And uh, we'll have, like, like Phil said, we'll have to pick some other topics to uh to have you back on debate with you <laughs> thanks a lot thanks everyone and uh have a great rest of your labor day weekend we'll see you back here in two weeks for the next, next rev war rev war all right thanks